Hello, this is Dr. Jim Thomas, and I want to welcome you to Fayetteville First Baptist Online. My hope and prayer for you today is that you're encouraged in your faith and challenged to walk toward a Christ-centered life. If you have any questions about today's message or would like to have more information on what it means to follow after Jesus Christ, please don't hesitate to email me at info at fayettevillefbc.org. I hope you're encouraged today. May God bless you. This is a new day, a day of celebration, for God has given us a new birth, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. He's rescued us from the darkness. He's brought us out of despair. In Him we have redemption. In Him we have mercy. In Him we have forgiveness. Today we stand in Christ a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Today we celebrate our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer. Sin is conquered, death is defeated, the grave is empty, and Jesus is alive. This is a new day. This is Easter. Amen. Good morning. Stand with us, church. Let's proclaim together. He is risen.
children who have recently uh, made decisions to, to follow Christ, and they're coming this morning to make that uh, public. Uh, our first is Keegan Chilvers. Keegan uh, started asking questions several months back of mom and dad, and um, being, being cut, became interested in, in, in what it meant to follow Christ. And as a result of that, um, in, a car, in a car conversation, uh, made the decision to follow Christ. Now, if you are our family or friends, would you please stand up uh, just in support of him this morning? All right, Keegan. Keegan, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's upon that profession of faith that I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk. This is Ava Maltaner. Uh, she's my daughter, and uh, I have the privilege of baptizing her this morning. A few uh, few months back, she uh, became interested and started asking questions, and um, through some time with her Sunday school teachers, um, during a, on a Sunday morning, uh, accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior, and now she she is ready to follow Him and obey Him. Ava, who is the Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus. Amen. If you're our family or friends, would you stand up in support of her this morning? Ava's. <laughs> Based on the profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk. Stand with us. Let's continue to worship this morning. Sing with us. God sent his son.
before you this morning just to give you praise. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory for all that you've done. Lord, there's absolutely nothing we could ever do to repay or thank you for sending your son to be crucified in our place. Father, this morning we pray that as we gather here as your people, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be here. And Father, we pray most of all that we would honor and we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to do that as we continue to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue to sing with us, church.
So why do we gather this morning? Why are you sitting in this room? Is it because mama asked you to be here today? Is it because of relig religious ritual that you showed up today? Maybe this is what you do every Easter and you've always done this. Maybe you don't get like ham and casserole unless you show up today, right? And so you're in this room today for a reason. Maybe those are some of the negative reasons, but can I say what the choir just sang and our worship team just sang is the reason that we're sitting in this room today is that we have been born again, Peter says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why we're sitting in this room today. I'm not trying to fulfill anything to get God to love me today. I'm not doing anything today to try to earn his favor or earn his pleasure. I am here today, and I hope you are here today because of something I didn't do, but because of something he did do. And because of what Christ did do, everything has changed in my life and in many of your lives as well. And as a result of that, we gather today to offer thanksgiving and praise and worship, not to a dead Savior on a cross, but to a living Lord at the right hand of the Father this morning. And so I hope that's why you're in this place and in this room today. But I think that if we're honest one, with one another, we need to throw a, uh, just a problem out in the middle of our living room this morning. And that is that we all struggle with the issue of trust and faith, don't we? Many of you uh, think that you have the natural or the spiritual gift of criticism. Some of you operate with the glass half full. Some of you operate with nothing in the glass. And some of you question if water even exists. And that's where you start every argument in your life, right? Someone tells you something and you immediately go to, ah, i got to check that out, you know? And that's fine when it's something maybe in the news or something here or there that you can go online and verify. But when someone says, I love you, and you go, yeah, let me research that first, then it gets a little more serious, right? We want evidence for things. And, and I fall into that category sometimes, too. I really do. Uh, in fact, it happened this week. I, I got a text from my wife on Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember which day it was. And she simply said this, Notre Dame is on fire. And immediately I started praying for everybody in South Bend. <laughs> and in my mind, touchdown Jesus was in flames, <laughs> right? And the football stadium was going down. It was going to tank their football season, which I don't necessarily have a problem with. But <laughs> sorry, any Irish fans in the room. But that's where I went. And, and I had this compulsion in that moment, there's, uh, what, I can't do anything. I said a prayer. I, maybe I just need to go watch Rudy one more time, you know, or something. I had that compulsion to watch that movie one more time just to support whatever was happening in Indiana. And then I went to the interweb or whatever we call it, and I, uh, and I Googled. I went to the Google, and, and I put in Notre Dame, and it came up, and I went, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. And then I started deciding, I don't know if you've struggled when you've Googled something, if you've decided which news feed you're going to actually watch and look at and read. Well, I don't kind of trust that one. I really don't trust that one. I kind of trust that one. Don't know what that one is. Maybe I'll go to this one right here, and I opened that one, and it had the video of Notre Dame de Paris on fire. And my heart broke. I love history. I love architecture. I love uh, European history specifically, and to see that classic cathedral on fire broke my heart. And, you know, you start thinking through, you know, it was under renovation. They were doing work there. And now, you know, a couple days later, you hear that it's going to cost billions of dollars to put this thing out. And everybody now is arguing over that and all that kind of stuff. And everything goes sideways again. And our ability to trust, our ability to have faith is shattered again, right? I think all of us struggle with verifying those things that are told to us. We struggle with this idea of faith, putting trust in those things that are unverifiable by knowledge or experience as a definition. We look at most things with a critical eye, want, waiting for something or someone to validate its truth or reality. But when it comes to God, He calls us to believe in Him. In fact, He calls us to faith. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way, that no one can come to God without faith. 
God calls us to believe in him, not based on an unreasoned faith. Nowhere in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, is Christianity described as some type of blind faith. We never see that anywhere. We see Christianity as a very reasoned faith. Many atheists who have come to Christ, many agnostics who have come to Christ, have realized that when they start putting all the evidence against whatever they want to compare that against, they realize that Christianity is a very reasonable faith. Yet it is still faith. You still have to take a step of belief in action to actuate that reality in your life. But God has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us in many ways through his creation. He's revealed himself to us through different prophets in the Old Testament. Ultimately, he has revealed himself to us in the person of his son. And so he calls us to believe in him, not based on an unreasoned faith, but on a faith that is evidenced by the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so this is what God did when he sent Jesus to Bethlehem. Let's just start there today. When he sent him to Bethlehem and he was born as a baby there, we have all these questions about who God is. And God says, okay, let me just come and dwell among you and reveal myself through my son so that you can understand more about who I am. In other words, if you want evidence for who I am, then look at me. As I reveal myself through the God-man, Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, in a collection of works called God in the Dock, which is a collection of essays that he wrote, uh, or that were compiled after he died, uh, the dock in that that title, God in the Dock, is the British lingo for a witness stand in a courtroom. And so basically what this book does through argument is put God on the witness stand and ask the question about who he is. And this is what Lewis says in one of the essays in that book. Then we come to the strangest story of all, the story of the resurrection. It is very necessary to get the story clear. He said, I heard a man say the importance of the resurrection is that it gives evidence of survival, evidence that the human personality survives death. Well, on that view, what happened to Christ would be what has always happened to all men, The difference being that in Christ's case, we were privileged to see it happening. But Lewis says this, but this is certainly not what the earliest Christian writers thought. Something perfectly new in the history of the universe had happened. Christ had defeated death. The door which had always been locked had, had for the very first time, been forced open. Something new had appeared in the universe, as new as the first coming of organic life. This man, after death, does not get divided into ghost and corpse. A new mode of being has arisen. Something brand new happened at the resurrection, folks. Something that had not happened in the history of the world up to that time. That this God-man, this God in the flesh, this man who was 100% God and 100% man, this Savior of the world, this Messiah, was crucified on a Friday. But on Sunday, he didn't rise in some heavenly form that didn't look like himself anymore. He's not some spirit that's walking around. No, he was raised bodily from the dead and appeared to many people over the course of 40 days. And because Jesus now has given us a new vision of what resurrection looks like, we can have hope because he is not dead, he is alive. And it speaks to this idea that we've been chasing over the last four weeks. If you're just joining us, we call it our key truth, the key truth that we chase through a series. I want you to write it down in your worship guide this morning because I think it's important. The key truth is simply this. The foundational elements of the gospel create the path for new and eternal life. The foundational elements of the gospel create a path for new and eternal life. Many of us would think when we think, okay, what is the gospel? The Greek word gospel, which means good news. And so what is this good news that, uh, the foundational elements of this good news that create a path for new and eternal life? Many of us would come into this room saying, well, the good news, the gospel as I heard it, is to go to heaven. But ultimately, biblically, that's just part of the good news. That is part of the good news. And if you come to faith in Christ, man, that's a great place to end up with him for eternity. But it's just part of the good news. But the good news is much broader than that. The gospel is much bigger than that. You see, the gospel is about a kingdom. And it's about a king that rules over that kingdom. And this king has died for the sins of mankind. But again, we don't serve a dead king. We serve a living Lord because this king has risen from the dead. 
And because he has risen from the dead, he calls us to respond to the resurrection. And can I just say this this morning, folks? Every person in this room, now every person in this world has to respond to the resurrection. You can write it off. You can say it didn't happen. You can argue all your philosophy or poor theology. Can I just be that bold this morning? Against the resurrection. You can say, well, it kind of maybe happened in a certain way. Or you can say, yes, he is risen from the dead. But whatever conclusion you come to this morning will dictate how you live your life for the rest of your life. And according to the Bible, will dictate your eternity as well. So this idea of the gospel is about a kingdom that has come, a king that was crucified and raised from the dead, and therefore we are called to turn from our former allegiance and to follow, believe in this king, and follow after him. And so what are the fundamental elements of this gospel? We've been looking at them in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says this, the Apostle Paul in verses 1 through 5. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, this is of first importance, what I also received, and he did as well, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the twelve. And so over these past four weeks, We've been examining the four essential elements of the story of Easter, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus' death, his burial, last week we looked at his resurrection, and now his appearances. So in doing so, we see the power of the Easter story to transform our lives in the present and give us life in the future. So today, or the last couple weeks, we've looked at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Today, we will look at the evidence of his resurrection through his appearances. So if you have a Bible today, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 21. John chapter 21, we're going to look at uh, one of the appearances in this focal text this morning in verses 1 through 8. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, if you wouldn't mind standing in the honor of the reading of God's Word. John 21, verses 1 through 8, this is the Word of the Lord. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Well, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. When we think of Easter, we usually think of Jesus' Passion Week, right? His death, burial, and resurrection, but rarely do we consider his post-resurrection appearances or the ascension, for that matter, which we won't have time to talk about today. But we don't consider his post-resurrection appearances as central to the story. But by contrast, the four gospel writers and the Apostle Paul consider these appearances crucial to both the story of Jesus and their message of the gospel. In fact, uh, Gary Habermas, the chair of philosophy at Liberty University up in Virginia, puts it this way. He says, the key to Jesus' resurrection is his post-death appearances. Critical scholars agree that the entire enterprise of the early church, worship, writings, and witness, would never have come about if Jesus' followers were not absolutely convinced that he had conquered death by appearing to them afterwards. You see, there's one thing to say that resurrection is a great philosophy or a great theology, that I can get my head around God doing something supernatural. 
But when resurrection becomes something that is encountered, everything changes. You see, the disciples could have probably gone, had some steam in their engines, and they could have probably gone a little ways with a philosophy or a theology of resurrection saying, well, he said he was going to rise from the dead. The women told us he was going to rise from the dead, but, or said that an angel told them that he was going to rise from the dead, but we haven't seen him. And therefore, I guess we can continue to go forward because we're going to trust that what he said was true, but we really haven't experienced him at all. But that first night when Jesus showed up in the upper room, Everything changed. Because resurrection moved from philosophy and theology to reality, and that reality changed their lives forever. In fact, all but two of the original 12 would give their lives, minus Judas Iscariot, obviously, who had betrayed Jesus and hung himself, and John the Apostle, who most scholars believe uh, lived out his days on the Isle of Patmos, potentially after that in Ephesus as an old man and died of natural causes. But the other ten disciples gave their lives. Did they give their lives for a philosophy or a theology? No, they gave their lives for a risen Savior that they had encountered, that they had seen, that they had touched, that that they had eaten with, that they had learned more from, that they saw ascend in their midst. And because of their encounter with a risen Lord, everything changed for them. And it's why you and I are sitting in this room today. The New Testament gives testimony that Jesus appeared to both individuals and groups over a 40-day period between his resurrection and the celebration of Passover in Acts chapter 2. And these appearances led his followers to take his message to the world. In fact, I think we have a, a screen that shows the resurrection appearances Um, that we can put up here. There were 10 appearances that are tracked throughout the New Testament through the the four Gospels and through uh, Acts and uh, 1 Corinthians. We're not going to have time to to break all this down like a seminary class today, but I want to give you a general idea today of the timeline of the post-resurrection appearances, starting with Mary Magdalene and the ladies at the tomb, going over uh, Resurrection Sunday into the next eight days, over the next few weeks, and then on the 40th day where he ascends before them. And so we see all of these different appearances individuals, groups that are small, groups that are large. We don't have time to go through all of these today because some of you have ham in the oven, okay? And so I get that today. So we're going to look at one of these in John chapter 21 as representative of his appearances and what we can understand about that today. So here's the question. What do the post-resurrection appearances mean for us and how can they impact our lives today? Here's the first thing. Write this down. That Jesus calls us to faith in him. Jesus calls us to faith in him. The word we talked about earlier, the word trust, the word faith, is the Greek word pistis. It means a changing of allegiance. Jesus calls us to change our allegiance from ourselves and our sin to follow after him. That's what it means to have faith in him. It's not just intellectual assent. It's not some emotional uh, overflow from our lives to this one who has done something so amazing for us. Those things may be included in that, but ultimately it is a surrender of our lives to the king of all kings and the Lord of our lords in following after him. That's what faith truly means. And so Jesus calls us to faith in him. So we jump really deep into the story really quick here. So following the women's report of the resurrection and Jesus' appearances to Mary Magdalene and then twice to the disciples, once without Thomas and secondly to Thomas, with Thomas in the room, the disciples leave Jerusalem and travel to Galilee where Jesus had told them that he would meet them. And that's what the angel had told the women to remind the disciples of as well. Now it's there we see in verse 1, of, this, of, of John 21, that Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the same thing as the Sea of Galilee. Okay, So many of these disciples were called uh, by that sea, and now they're going back to that base of operation up there where all of this started. Jesus then appears to seven of his disciples. That includes Simon Peter. John uses the, the double phrase for his name, Simon Peter, the most out of all the evangelists. But he, and he's mentioned here probably because he would become the leader of this band of disciples that would go to the world. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin. He shows up. He had a pretty good experience in the upper room. So he went on and made the trek up to Galilee as well because he had touched and seen the risen Savior. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. Cana obviously being the place of Jesus' first miracle. The sons of Zebedee, who are James and the author of this uh, letter, John, or this gospel, John. And two other disciples that are unnamed here. So Peter pipes up because they're just hanging out, and this is what he says. He says, I'm going fishing, and they respond, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing in verse 3. So what was going on here? There have been preachers before, there have been uh, theologians before that see Peter's statement, I'm going fishing, fishing, fishing. 
I'm just translating for y'all. We're going fishing. Um, as some type of backsliding, some type of walking away from Jesus, some type of going back to their normal routine. I don't agree with that. I don't think that's true. Here's what I think is going on here. They had already seen the risen Savior twice, both in the upper room, one without Thomas and once with Thomas, right? The evidence of Jesus' presence among them in his resurrection was already starting to be cemented into their life. Not fully yet, and we'll see that in a minute, but it was starting to be cemented into their life. So they, they're simply being obedient to what Jesus is telling them to do. He said, go to Galilee, and then I'll give you more instructions there. Now, we know in John 20, Jesus said this, that um, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. But that's about all of the commission that they understood at the time. So they go up to Galilee, and they're hanging out. Here's what the disciples are doing. They're doing what they know to do. And maybe that's a good principle for me and you. That when we don't know what Jesus wants us to do, let's already do what Jesus has already told us to do. And if we can already be doing what Jesus has told us to do, it's going to occupy our time. Now, they did not have the benefit that we have of God's written word. Because it was still being lived out in their midst right then, especially in the New Testament. Yet we have God's written word now. So if you ever ask, what is God's will for my life? Why don't you start by reading this? The Holy Spirit will confirm that in your life. He will take you in some different directions based on God's word. And he will push you forward in faith. But I know there are those seasons of desert life. I know that there are those seasons of, of drought spiritually in all of our lives. So what do we do during those times? We do what we know to do. And that's what the disciples were doing, I think. I think they were doing what they knew to do. Here's the second thing, and it's really, really spiritual. They had to eat, right? And the Kroger wasn't open. Neither was the public. So what do you do? You hop in a boat and you go fishing, right? To get the food that you need for the day. And so they simply hop in the boat and they go out. And the testimony here is they went out and got in the boat and that night they caught nothing. Why'd they go out at night? Because these guys are professional fishermen. Some of them were. And they knew that the best time to catch the fish were at night when it was cooler. And so they went out all night but caught nothing. Well, just as day breaks, Jesus stands on the shore, but the disciples don't recognize him. I don't think this is any type of uh, spiritual thing going on here. Like on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus is walking with his disciples and they don't recognize who he was, there was an intentional spiritual blindness that Jesus allowed them to ask their questions and have a conversation. And when he broke bread at dinner that night, it was revealed of who they were talking to. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think it was dark. I think it was dark. They were 100 yards offshore, as we saw, and they simply couldn't see who that was. So, the, so Jesus is walking on the shore. They didn't know who it was him. And Jesus uh, asked him a question. Children, that word in the ESV is, is translated, can be translated friends. Uh, you know, the, our British friends would say lads. And maybe we would say, hey, guys, uh, that type of thing. Hey, guys, um, catch any fish? It was a simple question. And they respond by saying, no. Well, Jesus says, well, why don't you cast a net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, why they didn't clue in right here, I don't know. Because back in Luke chapter 5, when he was originally calling his disciples, he told them to do the same thing, right? And you would think at that point, maybe they were hungry, maybe they just weren't cluing in, maybe they were tired, whatever that happens to be. But it was almost very casual in tone in, in the Scripture, why don't you, it's kind of like one fisherman do another, right? Well, why don't you try over there? Cast over on the right side. Now, do we know that Jesus knew that that's where they were going to catch the fish? Yes, because the evidence comes in a minute. But they say, all right, well, we'll try over there. They throw the net over on the right side of the boat. And they're not able to haul in the load of fish. Now, it's at this point that light bulbs start going off left and right, right? And it's John, the one who loved Jesus, as he describes himself in his gospel, who leans over to Pete, or just trying to shorten it, didn't really work for me, just kept going, sorry. <laughs> he says, Peter, it's the Lord. Light bulb goes on, and Peter puts on his outer, outer garment. He had taken off uh, his, his garments. He's probably down to, you know, just, just uh, you know, undergarments so that he could have movement to fish all night. Remember, they, they weren't casting and doing this thing like us. They were hauling nets in all night. It was physical work. So he puts on his outer, outer garment, and he jumps in the water, and he heads to the shore. Well, the rest of the disciples come in the boat dragging the catch of fish, for they were only about 100 yards from the shore. What's going on here? We're talking about Jesus calling people to faith. What was the moment of faith? Was it throwing the nets over the side of the boat? I don't think it was. Because they hadn't recognized that it was Jesus yet. What was the moment of faith? It was jumping in the water. 
It was jumping in the water. The good news was cast the net over the right side and you're going to catch something. And then they did that. They trusted in the message of the good news. They saw that they hauled in fish and they responded in faith. Peter did. And he jumped out of the boat. Many of us have heard the good news today. It's Easter Sunday. It's not like many of you hadn't been here before. Many of you have heard the good news, and some of you have never jumped out of the boat. You're content where you are. You're content in the safety of that enclosure. You're content in God providing for your life. But you haven't jumped out of the boat in faith and really followed Him. And so as we look at the gospel in this first point today, it is simply this, that there is good news today, folks. There is good news of a risen Savior, and you can be content in the boat, or you can take a risk and follow that Savior and understand what eternal life is all about. And I think that's what Jesus is calling us to as well. Just as He called His disciples, He's calling us to place our faith and trust in Him. In fact, back in John chapter 14, Jesus was preparing His disciples for His imminent departure, His death on the cross, and this is what He said to Him said to them, let not your hearts be troubled. That's a good way to, to, to encourage people. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. And so Jesus is giving them good news, right? I'm going away, but don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to go and I'm going to my father's house. You're going to have a room for you. I'm going to prepare that. Then I'm going to come back and get you. Here's good news. Trust me. So my namesake, Thomas, said to him, well, Lord, I mean, uh, let's get practical here. We, we don't know where you are going. Um, could you can spell that out a little more for us? How can we know the way if we don't know where you're going? I don't think Jesus sighed there. There's no evidence of that. I I may read that into this. I think he was very directive. But he said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Do you hear what he just said? Here is good news. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Here's good news. I'm preparing a place for you. I'm going away, but I'll come back and get you. Don't worry about that. Same message that would be given in Acts chapter 1 by the angels. Guys, hey, hey, guys, why are you looking up? He's going to come back. Get to work. Don't worry about when he comes back. The Father has that all in hand. There's nothing you can do to expedite that or not expedite that. Don't worry about that. Go be about the kingdom work while you're here. It's the same message Jesus had given them, right? And so as a result of this, he is questioned because of a lack of faith, and he says, all right, trust me because I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. In fact, back in John chapter 3, Jesus said this, whoever believes, pistis, has faith, is allegiant to the Son, has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see what Jesus said there? That if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life. Do you believe in Him? Have you jumped out of the boat? Jesus calls us to faith in Him, but He moves us beyond that. And when we place our faith in Him, something else happens. This is our second truth, that Jesus assures us of His presence. Jesus assures us of His presence. It's one thing to pray a prayer, to say some magic words in a church somewhere or something. There's another thing to experience the presence of God right? Presence changes everything. In fact, this past Monday, I walked out of my house. I was heading up to the church for work, and, and I walked out, and I looked over, and something just caught, caught my vision out of the side of my eye, and I, I looked down there. I went, that is the biggest worm that I've ever seen in my life. I must go look at it. And so I started walking toward this biggest, it was like four inches long. I'm like, this thing is huge. And I went down and it looked up at me. Going to let that settle for a second. I won't show you the dance I did. <laughs> Backwards and sideways, a little pirouette, and kind of got back a little bit. A little karate, I've never done karate in my life, a little Taibo back in the day. But, you know, got in that thing, ready to go after. He's just sitting there sunning. And I went, okay, this is my first snake encounter of the spring. So, I collect myself. 
I walk back up to him and start to have a conversation. And I look down at the snake and I said, hey, buddy, because it softened the moment, right? And I said, hey, buddy, um, don't know you, going to have to kill you. <laughs> and remarkably, he was not bothered whatsoever. He wasn't. So I said, okay, what is the most humane way that I can rid the world of this pest? Uh, because theologists give you a little theology. Uh, some people have tried to defend my actions this week or, or gone against my actions by uh, creating categories for snakes, like good snake and bad snake. Um, but uh, there's just one kind of snake. Ladies, what kind is it? There you go. Um, so, so I said, what's the most humane way to rid ourselves of this, 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 this thing. And I said, well, I'll just get in my Jeep and I'll just drive to work. <laughs> He's in my driveway. I, I, I'm sorry you got out there, buddy, you know, but I'm just going to get in. And so I got in my Jeep and plus there, it created distance, right? And so I got in my Jeep and I just went, oh, I forgot something and backed up. And no, I got it. No, I went up and I, like two or three times, right? Marking up our driveway. And I put it in park, and I opened the door, and I looked down. And I know sh snakes don't have shoulders, but literally he was going. <laughs> I had missed him every time, right? <laughs> now, it obviously, he is a brave snake because he didn't, he didn't go away. And again, it, this isn't a python. You know, I did name him Leviathan, but he was only about four inches long. And I said, well, okay, you're going to look at me like that? You're going you're gonna to give that business back to me? We're about to get this on, you know? So I went back inside at a distance, and I, uh, I got a key. I went out to my shed, and I picked up a shovel, and I dispatched him to snake heaven. And then I made a mistake. I texted my wife. And I said, hey, and maybe this isn't the best opening line when you're dealing with a critter situation around the house. I said, hey, so I guess you didn't see the snake behind your car when you got in it this morning. <laughs> Send. That created a stream of text. Where is he now? Where is his mother? I didn't do the genealogical, what, you know, that type of thing. Now, I, I want to make this very clear. I want to make this very clear because we have a ham in the oven too and I want to eat lunch. Um, I did not question my wife's integrity at all or her word when, when, when any of this was going on, okay? I trusted that I did the best thing and I was her hero that day. Was that correct? Praise the Lord. Thank you. I get to go home today, Okay. But here's the point this morning, folks. Presence changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, you can tell me your snake story, but if I've never seen a snake, ooh, that's terrifying in a philosophical way. I would be terrified too. But you almost step on one of those things, dude, life changes, right? The way you think, I, I tell you what, every time I walk anywhere in the outer of doors right now, man, I'm swiveling eyes, you know? And if the stick moves, run. Okay, that's just a general, general presence changes everything. And can I tell you this, when the disciples encounter the risen Jesus, his presence changes everything. It makes them think differently. It makes them see differently. It makes them act differently. Everything that they do is now different, not based on who they are, but based on who he is and his proximity to them. And so when those in the boat land on the shore, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread in verse 9. And just as Jesus has served them in the days of his flesh, he now continues to serve them by preparing a hot breakfast after a long night of work at sea. Jesus says this, bring some of the fish that you just caught. Verse 10. I love this. Peter then goes back aboard the boat and hauls the net of fish ashore, including 153 large fish, but the net does not break. Okay, two things about Peter here. Number one, dude's a hoss. Okay? You got six guys trying to pull this in the boat and can't get it in the boat, and they finally get everything to shore. And when Jesus says, go get some more fish, he picks up the whole net of 153 fish and hauls it over to the campfire. I'm hanging with that guy. You know, this is, you know, biblical security right here, right? He's a big dude. I think something else was going on as well. Two more things. One of the things I'll tell you right now, one in a second. I think there was an adrenaline rush going on. I think he was so pumped up that Jesus was alive and that Peter could be around him 
that everything had changed for him. He jumped out of the boat, left the rest of the guys behind. He hauls the whole net of fish over. And I love how Jesus kind of brings down that adrenaline. Listen to what he says in verse 12. Hey, 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 hey. Come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. Have a seat. Come and have breakfast. John then says this. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And I think it's that natural skepticism. Okay, we see you. We've seen, this is the third time we've seen you. We saw you on the shore. We caught the fish. We got to shore. You're cooking breakfast for us. You're talking to us. We're hearing you. Is that really you? But they knew it was him. They knew it was him. In fact, D.A. Carson puts it this way. It was almost as if the disciples were reluctant to come, even as they were eager to be with him. But here, Jesus reassures them, meets their physical needs, serves them as he did before his passion. It's a time for them to adjust to the new eschatological situation. It's a time sufficiently symbol-laden in a culture where symbols were more highly regarded than in our own to speak to them powerfully as they meditated upon it about the Lord's continued presence and power with them as they prosecuted the mission with which He charged them. In other words, they're still trying to figure all this out, folks. We have 2,000 years of history and theology to say Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. They had a couple weeks and two appearances. And when they're sitting around that morning campfire and they're smelling the fish cook, cooking and they see the risen Savior in front of them, they're still trying to figure all this out. Because resurrection had moved from theory to reality because of the presence of the risen Savior. So Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. John says that this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection, obviously not including the time with Mary Magdalene that happened before that and the women. Jesus assures us of his presence. Uh, A couple days, maybe a week later, he would uh, take them to a mountain in Galilee. We don't know which mountain. And he would commission them. And I want you to hear that commission one more time. This is what he says. He just reiterates what he's already been telling them. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Listen, and behold, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Do you realize that was not only a promise for the ones that were there, but that's a promise for us today? Because he promised his presence, which would come in the form of his Holy Spirit, to dwell and lead, dwell in and lead believers till Jesus returns. And if you're a Christ follower today, that promise is, is actuated in your life right now. That the presence of Jesus is with you through his Spirit right now. And he has not left you. He is present with you, and He is here to empower you and to direct you so that you can fulfill the commission that He has given you. Jesus calls us to faith in Him, and He assures us of His presence. And He does something even deeper in our lives. And that's our final truth today. That is that Jesus restores us and gives us a purpose. All of us are looking for a purpose, right? And all of us think we fall too too short of actually fulfilling anything that God would give us. But can I tell you today that that's a lie? That Jesus, when we come to faith in Him and we experience His presence, restores us to a right relationship with the Father and gives us a purpose that is eternal in nature, not temporal in nature. So here is where the attention turns back to Peter. And here's the third thing I wanted to tell you a second ago. Not only um, did Peter... Get uh, was a hoss and that he was kind of he was kind of jacked up on adrenaline pulling stuff in and jumping into the sea, but I also see something else happening here with Peter. Do you think maybe that he was doing a little penance? He had denied Jesus three times. Remember what we said last Sunday, if you were here, when Mary Magdalene, when the angel spoke to Mary Magdalene, she said, "Now go and tell his disciples and Peter." Why did she do that? Why did the angels tell Mary to do that? Because Peter, the good news, there's a possibility Peter didn't think it was for him. And the angel, God's word through the angel, wanted to make sure that Peter understood, even though he had denied Christ three times, that the good news was still for him. Now, Peter jumps out of a boat. Now, Peter hauls a bunch of fish in, and all of a sudden, we see Peter doing a lot in front of Jesus, 
Could it be that he was trying to make up for his mistakes? Could it be that we do that all the time? If I just do a little more, if I just do a little more, if I'm just a little kinder, if I'm just a little more religious, if I just give a little more money, if I'm just nicer to a person I really don't want to be nice to, then maybe God will love me. I love how Jesus diffuses this. He looks at Simon Peter and he asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Meaning the other disciples. And Peter says, uh, I mean, this is, this is the elephant in the room, right? Uh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. In other words, feed those who follow me. Take care of them as a shepherd. Jesus said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus responds, tend my sheep, lead them, take care of them. And Jesus asks the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And John says that Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus responds, feed my sheep, teach them, grow them. Help them to mature. Now, we understand this as the reinstatement of Peter after his previous denials of Christ. And it serves as a marker, both for the disciple and for you and me, to know and receive Jesus' forgiveness and commission. But this restoration and commission comes with a warning. Jesus says to Peter, truly, truly, in other words, pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go, which indicated how Peter would die for his Savior. Tradition says that Peter was executed by the Romans through crucifixion. Tradition says, we don't have any documentation, but tradition says that he requested to be crucified upside down so that he would not be crucified in the same way that his Savior had. And it goes back to this statement on a beach over breakfast that someone in your old age will stretch out your hands and lead you where you don't need to go or you don't want to go. And then Jesus says something interesting. Because I think if he left it at that, it would kind of be, all right, listen to what he says. Follow me. Follow me. Isn't it interesting? That's the same thing he told Peter back in Luke 5 when he first called him. He said this, and this is the point of all of this, okay? I'm reinstating you. I am forgiving you. I'm restoring you. But realize following me will not be easy because being a Christian, a Christ follower, is not easy. In fact, it may come to the point where someone will stretch out your arms and lead you where you don't want to go. So all in now, you understand what it means to follow me? Now follow me and watch what I do through you. It's an incredible invitation, folks. An incredible invitation to the Apostle Peter, but for us as well. It's a reminder of the high cost of discipleship, and we are to count that cost if we're truly going to follow Jesus. In fact, back in Luke 14, Jesus put it this way. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able to, with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, why, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. And then Jesus brings in the application for these two illustrations. And it blows our worlds away. And it calls us to faithfulness in Him. Listen to what He says. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that He has cannot be my disciple. It's an issue of priority. It's an issue of who your king is. It's an issue of who you're going to follow every day. Because everybody in this room is going to follow someone every day. Whether it be yourself, someone else, some idea, some philosophy, some other type of theology, whatever. You're going to follow someone. You're going to worship someone every day. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, I am the King of kings. I am the Lord of lords. Let me prove it to you. I'm alive. And I want you to follow me because I am really the only true God. But if you follow me, I want you to understand something. You are in enemy territory. And it's not going to be easy. And it may end up with your death. In fact, if you want to follow me, you need to renounce everything else, and then you need to live your life as if I were living it. 
And as you live my life in this culture, you become the light of the world. As my light is being seen through you, and as you fulfill the commission I've given you to take this gospel of the kingdom of God to the entire world. Now, do you understand what it means to be a Christian? If so, follow me. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? Nowhere in there does he say, if you walk an aisle and pray a prayer, you'll go to heaven. He says, if you follow me, you will live forever. And guess what? That includes heaven. So let me ask you a simple question today. Have you believed in this king? Have you believed in the risen Christ? Have you turned your allegiance from yourself and your sin to follow him? Have you known the assurance of his presence? And have you been restored to a right relationship with the Father and commissioned to take the message of the kingdom to the world? If you haven't, you can today. If you haven't, you can today. The same Jesus that offered this salvation to those earliest disciples offers it to you. Have you responded? Will you respond? Because when you do and you know the Son, He will give you new and eternal life. And that can happen right now.